All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my throat is really sore. I don't know if you can tell at all, but anyway, so my voice is not great today. So I'm having to stand, I mean, not stand, but put my face a little bit closer to uh, the screen so the mic can pick it up. So anyway, that's why there's no video of my close up of my face or anything. Um, uh, because of that, we may have a, a little bit shorter of a lecture. I might show a little short videos. Um, on some some thinkers that we'll be discussing so we are moving oh i guess before i go any further um i'm going to review the exam i think there might have been a question or two that could have been problematic uh some people had emailed me so anyway i'll i will look over those uh later today and i will let you know overall the exam grades were very good uh people got very good grades and um the packbacks have been great and so on so uh just bear with me today, and then on Wednesday I'll have more information regarding uh, the group project. Regarding World in Conversation, uh, they're still waiting there to send send out stuff, so if you haven't received an email, don't worry, they're, <laughs> and they haven't sent any out yet. So um, once they start sending them out, if you don't see one, well, I'll make an, an announcement that they're uh, going out now. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much all of the business uh, that I had to review. We are moving into war and terrorism. And so this this will cover the next couple of weeks. Um, so just, you know, be aware we're going to be talking about war and uh, terrorism quite a bit. These, this is one of those topics like science and technology that seems to uh, expand each each year that I, that I teach it. Um, maybe it says something about what's going on in the world or perhaps my interests. So just to, you know, give myself some cred or, you know, prove myself to you, <laughs> uh, my master's thesis was called Ethnic Boundaries and Conflict in Darfur, an Event Structure Hypothesis, and it was an analysis of the potentially the first genocide of the 21st century in Darfur, which is a part of Western uh, Sudan in Africa. Um, and I've looked at various different aspects of the conflict from sexual violence during during warfare. That's actually where my research began. Uh, and then I ended up looking at everything from rainfall patterns and, you know, cattle migration patterns and, you know, the cost of, of, of cattle because I was looking at two groups that that came into conflict. And actually, there'll be a lecture later where I'll focus specifically uh, on that and some of the things we can learn from it. Um, the, my, my research was the main source for this uh, climate change and conflict pre prevention because I was talking about uh, climate change and conflict when there were a lot of people that weren't, or at least not making the same, uh, the same connections that I was laying out. Now, I do want to say that one of the ways a civilization can fall is not just through war or civil war, but also through just a general cynicism and disillusionment. Um, and, you know, I think that many, I think that's kind of a prevailing attitude right now, um, this general sense of cynicism and disillusionment. So um, in order to save our, our civil, civilizations, uh, we should probably work on uh, disillusioning ourselves or whatever, and uh, becoming less cynical. So, though, you know, one thing to to think about we have to keep in mind is that you know warfare has really existed uh, throughout human history and probably predating when we became homo sapiens and it's you know it's been a uh, it's been a constant thing the nature and the the ways in which wars are fought have changed dramatically and we'll talk about that uh, going from you know clan conflicts over potential resources to complex arrangements between many different countries and uh, nation states and so on and so forth. Um, and we'll talk about the prospects for reducing war and, you know, the we'll look at the 20th century uh, as an example, at least the second half of it, and, you know, consider, you know, ways in which, or if it is possible to uh, dramatically reduce uh, conflict. But when we talk about war, we're also, we're also talking about power. I like this quote by the philosopher Bertrand Russell, the fundamental concept in social science is power, in the same sense that energy is the fundamental concept in physics. 
The laws of social dynamics are laws which can only be stated in terms of power. So power in society, this would be kind of a conflict uh, theory analysis, you know, power is really kind of the the fundamental thing in in society you know who has power gets generally gets uh, more decisions in their favor or gets to make more decisions uh, and this has has reverberations across the social system now looking at our close relatives who you know we've learned a lot about human behavior not just from sociologists and anthropologists studying humans but also from primatologists uh, that have studied different uh, different areas different primates uh, in, in different ways. So our closest relative of the primates are the chimpanzees and the bonobo. Um, the chimpanzees are the bit more popular one. You know, it's a very um, well-recognized name. In fact, they, they look pretty similar, and sometimes it's pretty hard to tell them apart. Uh, but they're, they act very, very much different uh, than, than, the other, than the others do. And, you know, I would say that humans are somewhere in between a bonobo and a chimpanzee. Well, wh wh how are they different? Basically, bonobos are, they're kind of like the, the 1960s Woodstock hippie, hippies of the, of the animal kingdom. Uh, just, you know, free sex. They are non-monogamous. They uh, have sex before meals, in celebration after meals, to celebrate having sex, you know, with one with another. There's, uh, you know, homosexual, heterosexual, etc., etc. <laughs> um, they do a lot of that. And they're also much more empathizing. And so they've done these different tasks with them where they look at food sharing and cooperation, uh, aggression, tool use, all of these things. And they find that the more cooperative, sharing, uh, you know, sort of interpersonal interactions are much more likely to happen with bonobos than chimpanzees. And you see the chimpanzees here, they're, they, you know, score higher or whatever on tool use and causal reasoning, uh, spatial memory, and they're more aggressive. So, as I said, humans are somewhere in between there, you know, I mean, we're not just aggress aggressive tool makers and users like uh, chimpanzees might be um, but at the same time we're not these uh, you know these completely cooperative um, you know loving loving species either so we're kind of we're we're in between those two I would say and others would say as well so if you're interested in um, you know the trolley experiment and, you know, if you found that fascinating and the different iterations of it, uh, that's fascinating. And if you're generally interested in how in group psychology and social psychology and how uh, ideas of us versus them form, um, I would highly recommend checking out this book, Moral Tribes by Joshua Green. So he did something fascinating. He, he started out as a philosophy major at Harvard, and he then became so many of the questions, you know, re relied upon knowing the brain and knowing psychology. So he actually eventually left the philosophy department, and went over to psychology, but he brought his philosophy ideas with him. And so he ended up actually testing a lot of the things that we've talked about. So he has this thing called trolleyology. And so what they do is they do the different scenarios with the trolley machine and then they look at people who make the decisions while they're in an MRI um, and then look at their physiological responses look at different physiological responses and it it, it really varies and you know it, it's pretty fascinating stuff um, I won't go in, in, into it in, in a lot of detail here but you know again I'd recommend he also has a lot of talks about it on, on YouTube and he also looks at the tragedy of the commons. He kind of describes the tragedy of the commons, and he kind of points out how we're in this sort of tragedy of the commons moment because um, because there's a tragedy in trying to realize what the common good is. So he's not really talking about resources. He's kind of using it more as like a metaphor. Um, you know, we, we tend to have disagreements about you know what the common good should be. So when we talk about societies, governments, wars, order, chaos, all these things, uh, it's probably good to bring in Thomas Hobbes. I mean, some of you may know him from a philosophy class or something like that. He was a f very influential writer in the 1600s, and he wrote this book called Leviathan, and it basically is government. And he's often misunderstood uh, by by basically 
because he supports a strong government that kind of watches over the chaos of, you know, the, the populace, he's often been called an authoritarian and things like that. And I'm not sure if that's actually fair. He was actually a pacifist and he was opposed to violence and, but he wanted there to be a strong leader, uh, to prevent violence from happening. So he was writing at about the time of the 30 years war in Europe, which was, uh, extraordinarily destructive. We'll watch a brief video about him for a moment. And I'll return. Oops. Another lecture there. Thomas Hobbes was a 17th century English philosopher who's on hand to guide us through one of the thorniest issues of politics. To what extent should we patiently obey rulers, especially those who are not very good, and to what extent should we start revolutions and depose governments in search of a better world? Hobbes's thinking is inseparable from one major event that began when he was 64 years old and was to mark him so deeply it coloured all his subsequent thinking. Remarkably, he died when he was 91, and so everything he's remembered for today he wrote after the age of 60. This event was the English Civil War, a vicious, divisive, costly and murderous conflict that raged across England for almost a decade and pitted the forces of King against Parliament, leading to the deaths of some 200,000 people on both sides. Hobbes was by nature a deeply peaceful and cautious man. He hated violence of all kinds, a disposition that had begun at the age of four, when his own father, a clergyman, was disgraced and abandoned his wife and family after he'd got into a fight with another vicar on the steps of his parish church in a village in Wiltshire. The work for which we chiefly remember Hobbes, Leviathan, was published in 1651. It is the most definitive, persuasive and eloquent statement ever produced as to why one should obey government authority, even of a very imperfect kind, in order to avoid the risk of chaos and bloodshed. To understand the background of Hobbes's conservatism, it helps to realize that across Western Europe in the 17th century, political theorists were beginning to ask, with a new directness, on what basis subjects should obey their rulers. For centuries, way back into the Middle Ages, there'd been a standard answer to this, contained in a theory called the divine right of kings. This was a blunt, simple, but highly effective theory, stating that it was none other than God who'd appointed all kings, and that one should obey these monarchs for one clear reason, because God said so, and he would send you to hell if you didn't agree. But this was no longer proving quite so persuasive to many thoughtful people who argued that the right to rule ultimately lay not with kings, but with ordinary people who gave kings power and therefore should only expect to take orders from kings so long as, but only so long, as things were working out quite well for them. This was known as the social contract theory of government. Hobbes could see that the divine right of kings theory was nonsense and, what's more, was going to be increasingly unpersuasive as religious observance declined. He himself was privately an atheist. At the same time, Hobbes was deeply scared of the possible consequences of the social contract theory, which could encourage people to depose rulers whenever they felt a little unhappy with their lot. Hobbes had received a first-hand account of the beheading of King Charles I on a scaffold in front of the banqueting house of the Palace of Whitehall in 1649, and his intellectual labours were directed at making sure that such ghastly primitive scenes would never be repeated. So, in Leviathan, Hobbes puts forward an ingenious argument that tries to marry up social contract theory with a defence of total obedience and submission to traditional authority. The way he did this was to take his readers back in time to a period he called the state of nature, before there were kings of any kind, and to get them to think about how governments would have arisen in the first place. Key to Hobbes's argument was that the state of nature would not have been a pretty place, because humans, left to their own devices, without a central authority to keep them in awe, would quickly have descended into squabbling, infighting and intolerable bickering. It would have been a little like the English Civil War, but with people in bearskins bashing each other around with flint tools. In Hobbes's famous formulation, life in the state of nature would have been nasty, brutish and short. 
As a result, out of fear and dread of chaos, people were led to form governments. They had done this willingly, as social contract theorists maintained, but also under considerable compulsion, fleeing into the arms of strong authority, which they therefore, Hobbes argued, had a subsequent duty to keep obeying, with only a few rights to complain if they didn't like it. The only right that people might have to protest about an absolute ruler or leviathan, as Hobbes called him, was if he directly threatened to kill them. However, if the ruler merely stifled opposition, imposed onerous taxes, crippled the economy and locked up dissidents willy-nilly, this was absolutely no reason to take to the streets and demand a change of government. As Hobbes wrote, Though of so unlimited a power, men may fancy many evil consequences, yet the consequences of the want of it, which is perpetual war of every man against his neighbour, are much worse. He admitted that a ruler might come along with an inclination to do wicked deeds, but the people would still have a duty to obey this person, as human affairs cannot be without some inconvenience. But this inconvenience is anyway the fault of the people, not the sovereign, because, as Hobbes adds, if men could rule themselves, there would be no need at all of a common coercive power. As he went on, he that complaineth of injury from his sovereign complaineth of that whereof he is the author himself, and therefore ought not to accuse any man but himself. Hobbes's theory was dark, cautious, and not especially hopeful about government. In our more optimistic moments, we want him to be wrong, but it seems Hobbes's name will always be relevant and fresh again when revolutions, motivated by a search for liberty, go horribly awry. Hobbes maintained in the preface to Leviathan that he had written the book without partiality, without application, and without other design than to set before men's eyes the mutual relationship between protection and obedience. All right, so that's, that is Thomas Hobbes. Um, as I said, uh, you know, he, he, I, I think I said the Thirty Year War, the English Civil War that he was writing after. As, I, as the video showed, you know, he was opposed to violence, and so that's why he wanted there to be a strong uh, government. Um, so anyway, he's, he's a powerful thinker who's always relevant, especially uh, during chaotic times. Now, it should also be pointed out that usually you'll find these uh, philosophers and theorists in Europe, and sometimes they'll have a counterpart who was saying something pretty similar uh, about a thousand years earlier or so in uh, China, sometimes India. Um, so this is Yang Shang, also probably better known as Lord Shang, who basically was writing long before Hobbes was, and he was born during the Warring States period, which was a period in Chinese history where you had uh, a long conflict go on for a very long time. And, you know, much like in Europe, the Thirty Years' War or the English Civil War, uh, you know, he was deeply affected by the conflict and basically grew up uh, with warfare around him. And because of that, he, you know, was probably, you know, kind of like Hobbes and like Machiavelli, who we'll talk about later, you know, looking for some stability. And so he was trying to make sure that there was a rich, wealthier state uh, that had a strong army. Um, if you're familiar with Chinese government and its system, its history, uh, legalism, which is kind of a, a very bureaucratic uh, system of administration, uh, is something that he, among others, uh, developed. And just a quote of his, you know, the greatest benefit to people is order. This is similar to what Hobbes uh, or Machiavelli would say. You also, he said that, you know, leaders re receive this mandate from heaven, a powerful state. And I'll just read the quote. Humans are born having desires when they have desires, but do not get the objects of their desires. Then they cannot but seek some means of satisfaction. If there is no measure or limit to their seeking, then they cannot help but struggle with each other. If they struggle with each other, then there will be chaos. And if there is chaos, then there will be uh, impoverished. So again, there's this line of thinkers who, sometimes they're called conservative. I'm not sure if that's 
necessarily accurate, uh, but basically these kind of thinkers who are worried about anarchy and who would probably trade tyranny, or at least some level of tyranny, uh, for instead of anarchy. And, you know, that's something that is worth considering <laughs> at all times. Uh, you know, would you want a tyrannical government, you know, that made sure that there was food and, you know, water and, you know, places for people to live, or, uh, you, but you may not have, you know, as many rights and uh, things like this, or would you have rather have an anarchic situation where um, it's basically everyone for themselves, various different militias and, and that sort of thing. Neither is going to sound too appealing, uh, but you know maybe somewhere in between tyranny and uh, anarchy would be the best place to be. Which brings us to how is how exactly is how is anarchy kept at bay? You know, and we see this in the modern world, especially as people have more freedoms and are able to think beyond their perhaps their own culture, their own nation, that sort of thing. Well, this comes from, you know, this the definition that the famous sociologist Max Weber gives. The state, the government, uh, the or is the organization that has the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence within a territory. And so this is basically saying that, that you know, if you have a, a territory of land and there's an organization that says that they are the uh, government and they're providing uh, jobs and, you know, infrastructure and things like that, <clears throat> but then there's another group called uh, you know, the militia or something like this, uh, and they have more guns and weaponry than uh, the government does. What happens then in that situation? Well, the the government, uh, or I should say the group with the guns, uh, becomes the government. Um, so one of the things that every government has to do is make sure that it has control uh, of the forces of violence, of the military, of the police, that sort of thing. And we'll talk about this in relation to the United States and uh, the U.S. system, you know, and we'll, as opposed to others. So anyway, I don't know if this is the definition that people here in high school or or whatever in, in, in regards to certain uh, social studies and so on, what government is. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's this is really what the government is, what governments are. Um, if they don't have the, the monopoly on violence, then they're really not, they're really not the government. Kind of interestingly, if you look at the history of the Roman Empire, Rome, or I should say not the, the Roman Republic, they would have the generals with their, you know, soldiers, their legions, would not be permitted to enter Rome. Um, that was a way of preventing them from disrupting the Senate and disrupting uh, the, you know, relative, relatively democratic government that they had in Rome. Um, so, you know, Julius Caesar and all these others had to, you know, kind of park their armies outside uh, and, you know, then, then they could enter in enter Rome without their armies and stuff like that, but it was, uh, they were not allowed to bring their armies into the city of Rome as one way of maintaining uh, the balance between the civilian, uh, civilian government and the military generals. And Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, sometimes you'll hear that phrase, crossing the Rubicon, that the uh, famous river uh, north of, north of Rome. Basically, if you cross the Rubicon, then you're, it's, you're not you're not turning back you're going and you're you're uh, you're basically have to take over rome and become an emperor <laughs> um so when people say crossing the rubicon they mean uh you know they're they're uh going somewhere but they're you know not not turning back there was someone describing the uh, the insurrection here uh, in Washington D.C. on January sixth, and they said they didn't cross the Rubicon, uh, but they kind of dipped their toes in the Rubicon. I thought that was an interesting way to put it. As I said, there's Max Weber. Um, if you <laughs> need something to read, he's got these two gigantic tomes. <clears throat> Where he talks about a lot of stuff, <laughs> a lot of um, a lot of fascinating history. I mean, it's all it's all historical stuff. Um, but he kind of lays out different types of political systems, and a lot of it is still very relevant and applicable today. I mean, it's kind of kind of amazing, actually. Um, anyway, that's Max Weber. So, kind of Charles Tilly was another sociologist who kind of built on Weber quite a bit and looked 
looked at the development of the nation state. So he was interested in uh, Weber's definition of this organization that has this monopoly on violence. And so he wanted to investigate this further, kind of look at things over time, look at the relationship between, between militaries, between conflict, between economics, uh, and these things. That was some of his earlier work, and then some of his, his later work was also looking at uh, more recent conflicts and so on. Um, and he has this quote, war makes states, states make war. Um, and so there you know, raises a question about, about the nation state, about whether it's a good thing, whether it's a bad thing. Um, <laughs> that's a tough, big question, I know, but um, anyway. Now, um, as I said, I want to play another video. So kind of going back to China then, one of the classic, classic works of understanding military conflict is Sun Tzu's Art of War. Um, and as I said, we'll watch a short video about this, but Sun Tzu has made or his Art of War has made kind of a comeback. Uh, it's, it was read at high levels in the Trump administration. Liberals probably need to read it more often <laughs> um, because it talks about how to win wars without having to fight them, and that's perhaps the best way uh, to do it. So as I said, I'll show an, another quick quick video. I don't need to blow my nose somewhere. Okay. <laughs> In the age of bloody civil war, 2,500 years ago, a Chinese military commander, strategist and philosopher emerged. His name? Sun Tzu. After successfully defending the state of Wu against its neighbor Chu to the west, a book formerly known as Master Sun's Military Methods was born, which has later become known as The Art of War. The Art of War is the most influential treatise on war ever written consisting of 13 chapters, each of which is devoted to one aspect of warfare. It has shaped the way in which conflicts have been fought for thousands of years, from the Japanese samurai to the Napoleonic War. Not only has the book influenced military commanders and generals all over the world, it has had resounding effects on politics, sports and business to this day. The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It's a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence, it's a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. Sun Tzu has a holistic philosophy that if you follow correctly and study thoroughly, you will be victorious. Sun Tzu says, avoid what is strong and strike at what is weak. Sun Tzu is a strong believer that winning the war with as little unnecessary combat as possible is the key to true victory. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting, and the key to doing so is to know your enemy well. If your opponent is arrogant, pretend to be weak, so he will underestimate you. If he was relaxing, attack and give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Sun Tzu is essentially saying that if you know your opponent's weaknesses and how to exploit them, you will never lose. So at dawn, the hopeless Athenians do the unthinkable. They attack. They attack the weary Persians as they disembark their ships on shaky legs after a month at sea. They attack before they can establish their war camp and supply their soldiers. Sun Tzu says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. During the mid-1960s, a war took place between the North Vietnamese communists and the United States of America. Instead of confronting the Americans head-on, the Viet Cong had a different idea in mind. They used unconventional guerrilla warfare tactics, which included hit-and-run strategies. This proved very effective against the much larger military of the Americans. It's more important to outthink your enemy than to outfight him. The Viet Cong forces were inferior to the Americans in both man and firepower, so guerrilla warfare tactics allowed them to inflict significant damage while keeping their casualties to a minimum. They also had unparalleled knowledge of the terrain. This included a vast network of underground tunnels, allowing them to evade carpet bombing and escape the enemy. The terrain was also laced with various booby traps and landmines. Even though the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese were heavily out-armed by the American superpower, 
they were still able to defeat them as they truly understood Sun Tzu's philosophy. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. This philosophy can be seen in the World War II invasion of Normandy, known as D-Day. The British created several fictional units of troops stationed in Scotland who were ready to invade Europe through its northern regions, in particular Scandinavia. They then used several misinformation techniques to persuade Hitler that 350,000 of these troops were primed to attack. Radio chatter in Scotland lit up with the talks of these troops preparing for an overseas assault, and many of these transmissions were made easily interceptable. Allied spies who had been able to infiltrate the Germans reported these developments as well, reinforcing their legitimacy. These spies also took photographs of planes and tanks posed for invasion, but these were actually blow-up models in most cases. All this caused dozens of German divisions to go up to bogus locations and wait for an imaginary army to show up, whilst important battles were fought elsewhere. This method of dividing enemy forces was also employed to a greater extent on D-Day itself. Soviet forces kept around a million of the German forces busy on the Eastern Front, whilst the Allied invasion occurred on the Western Front. This tactic of dividing the enemy is one of Sun Tzu's key philosophies and allowed the Allies to achieve victory and eventually win the war. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe. All right, so <clears throat> you see that that has been an influential text, not just in uh, warfare or politics, but also in business and even sports. So um, this is actually the edition that I have. They have a good historical introduction that I really appreciate if <laughs> if you're interested. Okay, <clears throat> so I think as I said, I'm going to end it a little early today. When we come back, back or when I come back on Wednesday or when I post a lecture on Wednesday, um, we're going to basically talk about kind of the great powers and sort of the the, the competitions that, that emerge between great powers and um, we'll talk about how that tends to shape, almost literally shape the world in, in many ways. <clears throat> So um, hopefully my voice will be better then, uh, and, we'll, and I can uh, continue. So as I said, this is a war and terrorism. We'll be talking about a number of things. So we'll be talking about war between major powers, but we'll also be talking about terrorists, everything from uh, transnational terrorists of all different types to domestic terrorists, uh, and so on. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover when we talk about uh, war and terrorism, and I think... Um, well, it'll be an interesting part of the class. <laughs> okay, so um, as I said, I will be discussing the group project uh, on Wednesday. Actually, you'll see the, the instructions on Canvas tomorrow, um, but I'll go over them uh, on Wednesday's lecture. All right, everyone, have a good afternoon.